Quickly before we start, we have a whole bunch of sandwiches still, so even if you guys are a little, ah, there we go, yes, if you're a little bit hungry, <laughs> you should take one. So, continuing on. Scintillator quality assurance at the Snow Plus Experiment. Jacob McDonald, Queen's University. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob McDonald, and I'm a fourth year engineering physics student at Queen's University. Now, this past summer, I worked with the Snow Plus research group at Queen's, and I was working on building some detectors to monitor the quality of the scintillator for the experiment. Before I get into these detectives, however, I'm going to give a brief overview of the Snow Lab facility and the Snow Bus experiment itself. Snow Lab is located two kilometers underground in the Valley Pinto Crater Mine in Sudbury, Ontario. It was originally built for the original Snow experiment, but it's recently been expanded to house many other experiments due to high interest from other research groups. What makes Snow Lab ideal for astroparticle physics experiments is its depth causes a huge attenuation of cosmic radiation. Additionally, the facility is a clean room, which makes avoiding contamination of exp experiments much easier. Now, the Snow Plus experiment is the spiritual successor to the original Snow experiment, and it actually uses much of the same infrastructure. The goals of the Snow Plus experiment are to search for a neutrinoless double beta decay, and also increase our understanding of solar, reactor, geo, and supernova neutrinos. Now, neutrinoless double beta decay is a type of decay theorized from the possibility that neutrinos may be something called Majorana particles. A Majorana particle is a particle that is its own antiparticle. Thus, if neutrinos are Majorana particles, a neutrino and an antineutrino are the same thing. The significance of this is sometimes in some elements you can get a phenomenon called double beta decay. As you know, with beta decay, you get an electron and an antineutrino. Now, double beta decay double beta decay occurs, you get two antineutrinos. If they're Majorana particles, these two antineutrinos can annihilate each other, leaving you with no neutrinos and two electrons, hence neutrinoless double beta decay. Now, another significance of this is if the rate of this decay can be measured, it would be proportional to the square of the neutrino mass. Thus, the goal of the Snow Plus experiment is to measure the rate of this decay, if it exists, to accurately determine the neutrino mass. Now, the snow plus structure is absolutely massive in scope. It's a 12 meter diameter acrylic sphere that holds approximately 800 tons of liquid scintillator. And this huge acrylic vessel floats in a large bath of light water that is surrounded on all sides by a lattice that holds approximately 10,000 8 inch PMTs that all look inwards at the scintillator. The actual scintillator used is something called linear alkyl benzene, or LAB. This is actually a fairly common chemical that's used in a lot of household detergents and soaps. It was chosen for the Snow Plus experiment due to its high light yield, low radioactive impurities, and high optical transparencies, which is naturally important in this experiment since the PMTs have to look across such a large volume of scintillator. The LED is being manufactured for the Snow Plus experiment at a plant in Quebec, and before the experiment begins, it will be shipped to site via tanker trucks. Upon arriving on site, will be mixed 5% by volume with a chemical called PPO, which is a wavelength shifter that will shift the wavelength into the range that can be seen best by the snow PMTs. Also, a small amount of neodymium-150 will be added because this isotope has naturally occurring double beta decay. Now, the main concern with the scintillator in this experiment is that radon contamination could occur. Radon contamination can result from uranium or thorium in the atmosphere that has decayed down to radon naturally. Now the real concern with radon contamination is that eventually it can settle down to a long-lived stable isotope of lead. So obviously we wanted a way to check our scintillator as it arrived on site to see if radon contamination was going to be an issue. And the best way to identify a radon decay chain was to look for the signature bismuth polonium decay in the radon decay chain. What makes this the best way to identify a radon decay is the fact that the bismuth decays with a beta particle, an electron, and it's followed very quickly within a few hundred microseconds by a polonium decay of an alpha particle. Thus, you know you have a radon chain if you see a decay that's an electron followed by an alpha particle within a few hundred microseconds. Now, the first detector I built does exactly this. It's a bismuth polonium counter that will monitor the LED as it arrives on site from Quebec. 
Now the way this works is quite simple. When the tanker trucks arrive on site with the scintillator, a little bit from each tanker truck will be pumped into a small acrylic cylinder in this detector. There's, a small, or there's an 8 inch snow PMT that is situated in this detector to monitor this scintillator. Basically whenever it sees a decay and emission of a beta and alpha particle, it will send a signal in. And we have a special uh, beta alpha counter designed by Oxford that is attached to this PMT. The way this counter works is whenever it sees a beta pulse, it starts a counting window that lasts a few hundred microseconds, basically the half-life of, of, of polonium decay. If it sees an alpha particle within this window, it will register a radon decay. But if it doesn't see one, the window will simply reset after time has expired. Now this left us wondering if we needed to implement a muon veto in this device because cosmic muons, when they interact with LAB, actually create a beta-like pulse that could be confused for a beta decay. And this could obviously lead to untrustworthy or false readings in our detector. So the easiest way to test this was to simply build a muon veto and test it out. Now we did this by taking a plastic scintillator paddle and placing it over a small sample of LED. And we connected both of these to a linear gate. Basically, if we saw a signal in both the plastic scintillator paddle and the LED, we knew it was probably a muon since muons can pass very easily through matter. So we made the linear gate not let the signal through. If the signal only occurred in the liquid scintillator, the LED, then it was allowed to go through to the Oxford system, which would then determine if it was a rate of decay. Now the results we got from this were pretty promising. As you can see, there are two main distributions of data there. One on the left at lower energy and the one on the right at higher energy. And the one on the left at lower energy was really only there when there was no muon veto in place, which suggests to us that this was the result of muons instead of physical cloning decays. So it appeared that we had a muon veto that actually was effective. So now we had to make the decision, was it worth it to actually implement this in the experiment? Because we effectively had no budget for this project. And electronics were pretty expensive. The electronics we built this with were actually pretty faulty and actually completely died out on us in the end. In the end, we decided that we didn't need a muon veto because as you saw from the data, there were two very distinct groupings of energy. So we could easily just keep the grouping we wanted by performing post-collection threshold cuts just to keep the higher energy readings. Additionally, the probability of a muon interfering with a real bismuth polonium decay is very low because the bismuth polonium decays happen like they're very rare. A muon interaction with matter is very rare, and the window that the muon must interrupt is very tiny. So here you can see an exploded view I made in Autodesk Inventor of the actual detector. In the bottom left corner, you can see the acrylic cylinder that holds the liquid scintillator. Not pictured on the scintillator is the plumbing system that will pump the LAB in, because at the end of the summer, this was still in conceptual phases. In the top right corner, you can see the special container that will house the 8-inch snow PMT. Not pictured on this container is its own plumbing system, which was already in place, that allows us to pump in mineral oil between the face of the PMT and the top of the acrylic cylinder so we can ensure that the PMT and the LAB were in optical contact with one another. Here are some other drawings made in CAD that allow you to see what this device looks like fully assembled. And in the one on the right, you can see the orientation of the PMT with respect to the cylinder of LAB in the fully assembled device. And here are some pictures of the fully designed or fully assembled design. As you can see, the inside on the right was coated with a white titanium paint that's very reflective. And the goal of this was to keep any light created by the LAB inside the cylinder and reflect it up towards the PNT. We also surrounded the whole device with a ton of black masking, like all kinds of tape. Basically just to <laughs> prevent any outside light from getting in and interfering with this scintillator. At the end of the summer, we did do some very quick tests with this, and the PMT was behaving as expected, so once the plumbing is implemented, this device should be ready to go for the smokehouse experiment. Now, the second detector I built was a light field monitor that would monitor the liquid scintillator throughout the lifespan of the snow plus experiment, and just make sure it's outputting enough light for the PMTs to pick it up. The way this was done was we had a 5-inch flat-faced PMT, 
And what we did is we sat a sodium iodide crystal and a small cylinder of LAB directly on the face of this PNT. When we put a gamma source near both of these scintillators, a spectrum could obviously be created from them and picked up by the PNT. And since we knew the spectrum from the sodium iodide crystal, we could, could compare the spectrum from the LAB directly against the sodium iodide crystal and see how strong it was and if it was within the strengths we needed. Here's an exploded VR chips detector. We basically took a PVC <coughs> cylinder and followed it a little inner lip for that 5 inch PNT to sit inside. And then we had an acrylic faceplate that we put over the face of the PNT to hold a small cylinder of LAB and the sodium iodide crystal. Now the plumbing for this cylinder of LAB will be exactly the same as the plumbing for the cylinder of LAB in the bismuth polonium capture, just on a much smaller scale. Here's a view of the whole device assembled, and on the right you can see how the 5-inch PMT was oriented with respect to the PVC tube and the acrylic faceplate. And on the left here you can see a, a partially assembled device with the PMT sitting on the inner lip, and on the right the acrylic faceplate has been taped into place and it's holding a, a sample of LED there. Not pictured is the sodium iodide crystal because it had not yet arrived at the end of the summer. We were, however, able to borrow another research group, sodium iodide crystal, and do quick tests. We found that this device also behaved as we expected it to. Thus, once the plumbing is completed for both of these detectors, they will be ready to be implemented in the Snow Plus experiment. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. You said that at the beginning, uh, the snow plus would be used to look at geoneutrinos. What is, what is a geoneutrino? I am probably not the person you want to ask about that because the <laughs> part I was more focused on was the neutrino is double beta decay. The phase I was, the snow plus experiment has multiple phases to it, and these detectors are being used for the neutrino is double beta decay phase, so I'm not completely up to date on what all the other phases are. Any more guys? <laughs>